In this video I'm reacting to the data platform that powers League of Legends from Riot Games. Online gaming is awesome, playing together with your friends or fighting epic battles against other players over the internet. Games like League of Legends let you focus on gameplay and hide the infrastructure completely from you. Although for engineers like me, the actual infrastructure is super interesting. Back in the days when I was playing a lot of World of Warcraft, one problem that always came up was lag, that actually you try to do something and you did it on your computer, but it wasn't registered at the server and then you had problems. What's your online game of choice and which problems are you facing? Let me know in the comments below. All right, so as always, this is from AWS My Architecture, which already tells us League of Legends runs on AWS. I added the link to that original video below if you want to check it out yourself. So what do you guys do? Uh, we're the game company behind League of Legends, Legends of Runeterra, Valorant, and a few other upcoming titles. Wonderful. Um, so we are here to talk about Hono over I I AP. Yes, yes, it's a mouthful. What is that? <laughs> so it is a new data ingest system for League of Legends. So the goal of this is data ingestion pipeline, how the player interacts with the servers, right? So let's skip the first part, the introduction part, and let's go right into how players interact. So they interact in a couple different ways. So players are connecting to our game servers and data centers around the world. Um, the game client is also talking to an API that's running in EKS. So this is something very typical in online gaming. You have your actual client that is your PC where your software is running on, where the game is running on, and then you have the server, the game server. The game server is where everybody is connecting to and the game server is managing uh, items, it's managing the players, it's managing all the, all the important factors of playing the game. Talk about the number of players. Uh, you know, how many are we talking about here in terms of scale? Uh, millions around the world in 20 plus shards. Game client and game server are both sending information about that player experience. Like, um, how are their games going? What here champions are they playing? Okay. Um, what kind of uh, things in the store or are they engaging with? We are uh, pulling about eight terabytes of data a day. The system peaks at about, you know, somewhere over 500,000 events per second. Oh, wow. And what's the geographic? reach I mean, is this I, I suspect it's global yeah global worldwide okay. um, all, all over the world uh, like I said 20 different shards or something like 20 that. different shards. so they have multiple regions because when you want to interact with other players the the ping or the the, the delay needs to be very low right so this way that's what I mentioned in the beginning that you might have lag where you're, you're doing something and it hasn't registered on the game server and the other player hasn't registered or hasn't seen that and the other player is doing something and so stuff is lagging behind and then you have these, these interesting things that you went behind the corner and the other player already sees you in front of the corner and shoots you and something, stuff like that. You know, with that global presence, I'm sure, and the you know amount of data that you are gathering, how do you deal with that level of flow and uh, to make sure performance is uh, uh, sufficient? So, well, it's challenging. There's 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 challenges with network connectivity and throughput. Mm. Um, these are all data centers that are hooked up through our Riot Direct network up into kind of the nearest AWS region, but that okay. network can become congested at times. That's actually something that is interesting. Computers that are hooked into the AWS network that run into to in their environment. So is are these running within within AWS or are these within a local network or a local data center that is connected to AWS? It's not 100% sure. I hope they they put this directly on AWS. You know, once you uh, connect into EKS, what's the next thing that happens? So data flows from EKS into MSK here. And okay. um, this is kind of our, we have a regional buffer where there's five different regions where data flows in, data is collected, uh, and it's prepared for processing. Okay, so managed streaming for Kafka. And then, uh, you know, how do you deal with that level of data flow? Uh, can you talk about the d dynamics? Like, how is that working? Well, one thing that is interesting here is that they actually went for MSK uh, managed streaming for Kafka and not for Kinesis, but we're going to see why in a sec. Well, so MSK 
just kind of takes care of a lot of that for us. Great. Which is, uh, Kafka is a very robust streaming data platform. And, um, you know, we're able to scale up and out like as we need to. We've kind of settled on a nice scaling pattern that's that's served us well. That makes perfect sense. And then what about the gaming servers? Uh, do you have any level of... That's, by the way, one of the cool things with, with Kafka that you it's in your hands, right? And you can figure out how the scaling works and you can optimize it. It's not like Kinesis where you get the shards for your message queue and that's it. You can't really optimize stuff. So the data is buffered here locally. And um, then we use Mirror Maker to replicate data out of a local Kafka cluster here into those regional MSK clusters. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. You see, this tells us here is a, here's a, let's do a K here. This is the local Kafka within this. And they're mirroring this up here. Right. So what we're seeing is the live system, everything that is regarding the player and player interactions with the, with the system, player interactions with other players, that's going to run within the game server. So this part is what the user usually is, is playing with. This is for action. This, the other part here, these three, these are then most likely for analytics. That's why they have S3 as files in here. That's why they have glue in here. So most likely they are they are gathering statistics data over this, and they are they are analyzing what are people doing, how are the games going, how on different maps are, yeah, different win statistics or which classes are better, and so on, or winning more, doing more damage, and so on and so on. So that's what they're doing in this part. The actual gaming part is, is the lower part. The upper part here is the actual analytics part. So Mirror Maker is a component of, of Kafka. And why do you do that? Uh, well, it's like, like I mentioned earlier, network connectivity can be a challenge. So um, when we hit peak players, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's a huge difference from when we're in off time, from what just kind of network is available. And that, that player experience is the most important thing. So I don't want to be... Uh, degrading their ping by, you know, trying to send a bunch of data back to our system. That actually makes sense, right? Because this is the most important connection here. This, the player client, the player, uh, player's computer to the actual server. That's the most important thing. And you don't want to jeopardize, jeopardize this connection here because you're sending out logs, you're sending out statistics to the back. You don't, this, this needs to be, this has lower priority here. The, the main priority is the paying customer, is the playing customer, it's, it's this here. So once everything lands in MSK, we have a uh, Spark job, Spark streaming job, which is writing the data out into uh, Delta Lake in S3. Okay, so they don't have that on the board here. But it's actually here's another here's a spark here's a spark service and this spark service actually streams the data or takes the data here from here and does this that's that's what this means here so it's a bit more complicated makes sense i'm guessing they're what they do here is they're because with spark you're setting micro batches right it's not full streaming so they could set a micro batch of like a minute or something here and then they take all the data from the msk for a minute do it or process it with the spark job and then put out the files for this and keep the files lower and keep it keep it nicely distributed because otherwise what you would have is you would have you would have data on your message queue here right data is coming in like this and if you have a spark job that only reads the data once an hour you would have something like this where you have a lot of load on your message queue and then it goes back down and like this and this would be if you have a single job that is that is once an hour started or you could do something like this where you have these small small micro batches that start every minute or every 10 minutes take out data from the message queue and this has basically this is the right uh, and this is the read load here. So this means you, the write load is quite static, but the read load, you want to have something like this. 
a well distributed load because this here ultimately this can influence this here as well i don't want that you want to have an even write distribution and a very even read distribution from the from the um from the message queue because also then if you do this 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 will generate large files here so you will have big files in if you do just once an hour you will have big files in s3 if you do this you have a bunch of smaller files you could partition them there are always up and downsides depending on what you want to do but it's an interesting concept that they have spark in here somehow you need to get the data from the message queue over and you need some kind of processing for this and then, uh, okay, so you then, that's your data data store, uh, data lake. What do you do with that data? Uh, so that serves everybody from, um, uh, so we have our data consumers at that point. So mm -hmm. everybody from analysts, designers, uh, engineers, executives are running their queries against that data, ETLs running against that data. And that's like kind of provides insight into what's happening in the okay. game. Okay, so what's that user, what would that give to the user? That's the thing. To the user, most likely this will not give a lot to the user because this is an internal analytics pipeline that they build around this. As they said, for designers, for analysts, this is something you want to have for people who are engineering the gameplay. What's the user experience? So when you have this set of information, what do I get as a player, say, for example? Um, so like something like, uh, say we roll out a new patch mm -hmm. and we've made some changes to, to, to champions. It's it's like kind of critical to see what effect did that have on gameplay? Are, are, are players see. winning more with that champion now? Has the length of games changed? Are the towers falling earlier? So um, th this system moved kind of the, the time to get that information out somewhere between like six and 24 hours down to five minutes. So, oh, wow. Okay. So, so that's pretty impressive. And then on the consumer side, I do see glue. So yes. Can you talk about the consumer side? Yeah. So uh, we have Databricks running. Um, Glue is our meta store. So Glue is um, kind of the information about what logical tables are there, where are those files in S3, um, and it acts as our permission and access layer between our users who are acquiring the data and kind of the raw stuff out of Okay. So do you have? Okay. So Glue is here actually not the processing. Glue is just the metadata. It's just the the data catalog here. And Glue has the information of where is everything laying around. Where are the files? What's happening with the files? And you have, you then have your Spark, which actually processes the data in S3 and therefore knows what's what's happening and puts it up and, and generates the outputs. Have you know consumers here using the Glue to then uh, access at least to, to view and see mm -hmm. and search mm -hmm. for the data. So Drew, thanks for walking us through. Yeah, they, they didn't tell us this, right? They just said here, they have glue for to access the data to S3. So what you could have, again, the simplest way here would be you have Athena running here. Athena or Redshift Spectrum. And Redshift Spectrum, you use the glue um, data catalog. And then you query the data and you have your visualization around here below here and the vis actually uses athena to query data from the from from the buckets or redshift spectrum here it's which is basically the same thing just you run a you run a redshift cluster i actually did this in one of my courses modern data warehouses and data lakes that's that's exactly what what i've done here and also I did this on AWS and on GCP, it's the same same structure. You have some kind of a data warehouse that knows where the data is lying, and then you use it, use the database to to yeah, to query the data. That was really interesting. So we didn't we don't know a lot how the actual game servers are set up, right? We know we have a, a Kafka message queue here for our backend for analyst analytics. We are not really, we don't really know what, what's happening within our, within the game servers. Well, the interesting part in this is that there's a lot of analytics around this, right? As you said, they roll out a new patch. They want to know immediately what's happening. What, how is it changing? How are, the, is the player behaving changing? Is some kind of, some class overpowered now and people are just using this and always winning and so on. So this is what, where this is helping a lot. And this is why analytics is so great for this and is so great of a use case for engineering. 
right? You have this connection here is very simple. You have the client, you have the server. These are the, the gameplay is happening here, but you want to know what's actually happening. And that's, that's really cool. That's a cool use case. Yeah, I said this is what I also did in my course. So when I go into my course here, I was looking here, data warehouses, ETL, ELT pipelines, data lakes, and then warehousing data lakes on AWS and GCP. And I explained this, basically the, the two differences between transactional and uh, analytics parts of a platform again, because this is where we're actually working here. This is what they showed us in our in this video, this this lower part. It's not the transactional part that that actually cares about the gameplay and the interaction between the client and the the and the game server, right? That lets people play. It's the analytics part. And that's what we have seen here also in this. They are dropping data here in S3 buckets. And from there, how can you access the data? Use something like data catalog from Glue. That's what they're doing because the data catalog knows the data here in the bucket. And then use, for instance, Athena and QuickSight here to or Power BI to connect the data, make this information in the bucket available as a table, and then query it from your data warehouse, uh, query it from your data visualization. Same thing I've did in this example with GCP. It's very simple. I didn't use the data catalog there, but you have cloud storage where you drop your files. You have BigQuery where you can say, okay, these files are structured in that way. This translates it into a table and then you have your data studio where you where you visualize the data. This here is an example from QuickSight where you have your data as a table and you can then query it and, and visualize it as a table. And that's for that was for GCP where you then create your dashboard, put the table on it, you configure an input field and then you can work with it. Yeah. Again, if you want, if you're interested in that, check out my academy. If you're interested in more of these videos, uh, link below is also to the playlist because I already did a few of these. I'm going to do a few of these. So check out the playlist, check out the other ones. There are all, a lot of really cool ones coming, interesting ones coming. Yeah. See you in the next video.